After a fire, an explosion, a business trip, and an alien abduction, I am finally back with part two of my Jewel Thompson cryocooler series. In this part, I am going to build a cryocooler that can reach minus 153C, which is cold enough to liquefy nitrogen under pressure. I started off by making some improvements to my large Jewel Thompson system from my previous video, first by replacing my faulty oil separator, then by insulating the heat exchanger inside a foam enclosure packed with glass wool. Just to be certain I was getting rid of all the oil from the cold stream, I added an additional oil separator downstream of the main one in case any small residue managed to make it through. This is not uncommon in this type of cryocooler, and some research papers I've read even show systems with three of these in line. With various blends of propane and ethylene, I managed to get minus 87C at the cold end. To go lower though, I need a little more control over my flow restriction, so I got one of these, an electronic expansion valve, or EEV. An EEV is essentially just a needle valve driven by a stepper motor, except the rotor and the stator of the stepper motor are separated by a stainless steel enclosure so that the rotor can be hermetically sealed inside the high pressure area. This way there's no need for o-rings or other rotating seals that can shrink and leak at low temperatures. An EEV stator coils are wired slightly differently from a typical stepper motor, so a regular stepper motor driver like an A4988 won't work. Both coils are center tapped and fed from the high side, so switches or MOSFETs need to be placed on the low side to make a connection to ground and energize the appropriate half of a coil. My solution to this was an Arduino driven circuit where holding an open or close button will turn individual MOSFETs on and off in the correct sequence needed to drive the valve rotor clockwise or counterclockwise. The only other components are flyback diodes for each coil and a 16x2 character LCD display controlled over an I2C bus. The circuit is built on a breadboard shield for an Arduino and lives inside a little box I 3D printed. The display will count the number of steps from the fully closed position as the valve is open or closed. I'm going to hook it up to my air compressor and record the output pressure at different steps of the valve pin. Nothing seems to happen until the pin hits about 13 or 14 steps, then you can see the pressure begin to drop as I open the valve more and more. Here's a graph of the back pressure versus valve steps from the closed position. This is on a little half horsepower or 350 watt compressor. Everything seemed to work well, so I went ahead and chopped the old capillary off the cold end of the heat exchanger and brazed on the EV. It looks a little funny, but that's fine for a prototype. A quick test with pure ethylene, the cold end iced up pretty quick without any insulation over it. When I completely shut off the valve, the ice melts again. I still had a lot of thermal losses in this system though, even with the fine tuning by the expansion valve, so I needed a little boost. To provide that, I added a pre-cooler, which essentially made this a two-stage cooler. The pre-cooler is just an ordinary vapor compression stage using propane as a refrigerant that chills the gas stream down to close to minus 30 C before it enters the counterflow heat exchanger. This effectively jump starts the whole cool down process by around 50 degrees C. I also installed this really long liquid trap downstream of the interstage heat exchanger. This would almost guarantee that any moisture or oil that somehow did come through would fall to the bottom of the tall pipe and be unable to make it into the counterflow heat exchanger. The output line of the interstage heat exchanger measures at minus 27 C. The outside temperature is about 30 C, so that's almost a 60 C drop right off the bat. By tinkering with the EEV setting a little, I managed to get the cold head down to minus 117C at the valve outlet and minus 56C at the inlet. That's definitely progress in the right direction, but I should be able to reach liquid nitrogen temperatures with a single stage. Also, I want to water cool my compressor and place the counterflow heat exchanger in a vacuum for insulation, which I don't have the resources to do with my larger system. So I built this much smaller compressor assembly. This compressor came from a 5000 BTU window unit, meaning it would normally pull around 400 to 500 watts. The compressor lives inside a plastic bucket, which will be filled with distilled water as coolant. The cooling water will be circulated through a fan-cooled radiator, and this should keep the compressor from reaching the alarmingly high temperatures I was experiencing on the larger system. There's also a 2 liter buffer tank to hold more refrigerant, an oil separator, after cooler, filter dryer, high side pressure gauge, and low side pressure gauge next to a fill valve, which is hiding right behind the filter dryer here. After my bad experiences with the auto return mechanism on the oil separator from my last video, I opted instead for a simpler oil separator with a high pressure solenoid valve that would be activated on a timer. The counterflow heat exchanger was easy because I already had the coaxial heat exchanger from my first vapor compression video and I just had to do some minor modification to the piping to make it work for a Jewel Thompson system. Also, this would fit inside my 5 gallon vacuum pot. 
For the flow restriction, I installed a much smaller EEV that would be actuated with the same controller from earlier. Unfortunately, my solenoid valve got jammed with debris somehow and wouldn't fully close, so I replaced it with a 2 meter long 0.6 millimeter inner diameter capillary tube for passive oil return. This should be enough flow restriction that it won't steal much gas flow from the main stream. The vacuum lid was a half inch thick steel disc I got fabricated by Send Cut Send, which was actually cheaper than buying and drilling the raw material myself. It's the exact same dimensions as the tempered glass lid that my vacuum pot originally came with so I can reuse the same gasket. Unfortunately that gasket would leak when it was on the steel plate, so I had to 3D print some edge rings as molds and fill them with flex seal to form a thicker gasket. When the rubber was partially cured but still soft, I placed the vacuum pot on top of it so that the lip of the pot would form an impression in the rubber and make the gasket conform better when it was fully cured. Here's what the lid looked like once the rubber was dried and the heat exchanger was installed. A little messy with the excess rubber, but it looks surprisingly similar to a commercial system at this point. With a single fridge compressor, I pulled the enclosure down to 8 millibar, and with two fridge compressors in series, I got down to 2 millibar. Unfortunately, there was a slow leak, so I couldn't get below that pressure without a much larger vacuum pump. Performance was still pretty poor because the vacuum wasn't good enough to insulate the heat exchanger very well and the oil return capillary was actually stealing a lot of the gas flow, so I put some glass wool insulation on the coldest part of the heat exchanger and placed a manual valve in line with the oil return so that I could turn the flow on and off. By making those changes I managed to get to minus 119C with pure ethylene. Not too bad for a single stage system. That's cold enough to liquefy methane under pressure, but not yet enough to liquefy nitrogen. I suspect that a lot of my loss was coming from thermal conduction in the body of the valve itself. Inside the EEV, the entire temperature drop occurred over the span of a few millimeters, and the valve body had a relatively large cross-sectional area. Even though the body was made of stainless steel, which has a low thermal conductivity, the combination of large area and short distance was enough that it could cause substantial losses. To solve this, I placed a 1 mm inner diameter 1 meter long capillary in line with the EEV. The capillary would produce most of the pressure drop, but the EEV would provide fine tuning. This way, the temperature drop would be spread over a much longer distance, so less conduction loss should occur. I also wrapped the entire coil with a healthy amount of glass wool and replaced the tiny water radiator with a much larger one. This would help me get to a lower temperature by allowing the compressor to remain relatively cool while it was under a very heavy load. Here's what the whole system looks like. It sits on a desk right behind my PC so I can keep tabs on it while I'm working on other stuff during long runs. Yeah, working. Other stuff. The lowest temperature I achieved was minus 153C using a 30-20-50 mix of propane, ethylene, and methane respectively. This was at 460 PSI on the high side and almost 0 PSI on the low side, so it's a pretty big pressure ratio. One vitally important technique I discovered was that simply running the system at maximum flow restriction for the entire run wouldn't provide enough cooling power to get down to the lowest possible temperature. Instead, I would start a run with minimum flow restriction, meaning my EEV was wide open. This didn't provide as low of an ultimate temperature, but had significantly higher cooling power due to the higher mass flow rate. Only when the temperature began to flatline, I would slowly increase the flow restriction and wait for another temperature flatline before I increased it again. By using this technique, I was able to achieve the lowest possible temperature with the mix that I had. At minus 121C on the high pressure side, every component of the gas mixture, including the methane, is liquid inside the heat exchanger. Let's look at what we can do with a temperature of minus 153C. At this temperature, nitrogen will liquefy at 25.3 bar, or 352 psi. Air will liquefy at 20.2 bar, or 278 psi. Argon will liquefy at 12 bar, or 160 psi. Oxygen will liquefy at 10.3 bar, or 135 psi. And methane will liquefy at just 1.9 bar, or 13 psi. So while I can technically liquefy nitrogen with this device now, there's very little overhead at minus 153C because that's the temperature of the cold end without a thermal load. Realistically, I'd expect the cold end temperature to go up 20 to 25 degrees or even more under load, so the realistic operating point for actually liquefying gases is probably closer to minus 130 to minus 125C. However, this temperature range would still allow me to liquefy methane somewhere between 7 to 10 bar, which is only around 90 to 130 psi gauge. Then, when it's discharged to atmospheric pressure, it should cool to minus 162 C. So let's try to make some liquid methane. 
As a heat exchanger, I simply strap this 4 inch length of 3 8 copper pipe to the outlet pipe of the expansion valve, then applied a very sloppy blob of solder just to give it decent thermal contact. This probably isn't the optimal solution, but I just want to see if I can at least get a few drops of liquid out of it. I drilled some extra holes in the vacuum lid to run the inlet and outlet lines for the heat exchanger, which were just 2mm inner diameter copper tubes. Then I sealed the pass throughs with Flex Seal. I also used this 1 liter paintball bottle as a buffer tank to provide a reasonably large reservoir of gas at high pressure. Using this, I should only have to run the gas feed compressor at partial duty cycle. The bottle is connected through this goofy fitting assembly which was originally intended for filling the paintball bottle from a larger CO2 tank. A gas hose runs from that fitting junction to yet another valve which feeds the heat exchanger to the cold end of the cryo cooler. Then I have another electronic expansion valve which I'm simply using as an on-off valve and then several meters of 0.6mm inner diameter capillary tubing to throttle the uh, liquid flow. The capillary tube feeds into a thermos with some glass wool as a lid. I've pulled back some of the insulation on the output line and you can see that it ices up when I open the valve and the temperature in the collection bottle goes down but there's no liquid coming over. I put a thermocouple on the output line and the temperature definitely drops when the valve is open but it's way warmer than the cold end of the cryo cooler at only minus 64 C. So while I've technically met the conditions to make cryogenic liquid, my setup really needs some improvement. In theory I should be able to continuously flow gas over the cold head to liquefy it but there's a ton of tuning required to get the flow rate just right to hit the optimal thermal loading on the cryo cooler. Instead, I'm going to redesign the cold head so that it has a relatively large reservoir for the feed gas that's in contact with the low pressure return line coming out of the expansion valve. This way, pressurized gas can just sit in there in contact with the cold return line as long as it needs to in order to cool and liquefy then fall to the bottom of the reservoir. After say 20 or 30 minutes, I should have accumulated a decent amount of cryogenic liquid which I can then discharge into my collection bottle. If I had say 100cc of liquid, there should be enough thermal inertia to overcome the losses in the output line and actually collect some liquid into my thermos. This is basically what I did in my video on cascade refrigeration where I successfully managed to collect some liquid nitrous oxide which was at minus 88C at one atmosphere. Also, I think the gas mixture can be optimized even further to get closer to minus 170 or minus 180C. At the time of editing this video, I actually reached minus 161C by adding a small percentage of butane into my mixture. By replacing some of my methane with nitrogen or even argon, I should be able to push below minus 170. Finally, all of this progress was made without pre-cooling. With pre-cooling, the gas stream coming into the regenerative heat exchanger is going to be at least minus 25 to minus 30 C, possibly even colder. That's around 50 degrees of drop from room temperature. With that much of a boost, it wouldn't be surprising to see close to minus 190 C unloaded and probably minus 170 to minus 160 C with 15 to 20 watts of thermal loading. If I can hit those numbers, which seems pretty feasible at this point, I should be able to produce several liters per day of liquid nitrogen. Then, if I can produce that much liquid nitrogen, I'll be setting my sights on an even more ambitious goal of liquefying hydrogen by using the liquid nitrogen for pre-cooling. In preparation for that project, I've begun building an electrolysis cell that can produce around 200 liters of gaseous hydrogen per day. Anyway, I think I'll leave it at that for this video. Expect to see some liquefied air for part 3, and don't forget to like and subscribe if you enjoyed this video. Thanks for watching.